In this video, we're going to look at interval laws for definite integrals. We've been working with the definite integral, and in this video, we're going to pay a lot of attention to the limits of integration. Up until now, we've assumed that A is always less than B. In other words, we're integrating left to right along the real axis. The goal of this video is to expand the definition of the definite integral to include the case where a might be greater than or equal to b. We're going to identify interval laws that govern manipulations of limits of integrals. And then we're going to work through an extended example to test drive these interval laws. A quick reminder that the definite integral from a to b measures signed area. So we're going to take an area above the horizontal axis minus area below the horizontal axis. And so far, to make sense of this, we've always assumed that A is less than B. Then we build Riemann sums and take the limiting value and so on in theory to find the value of the definite integral. But what happens if we go the wrong way? In other words, what happens if we try to integrate from right to left? Let's not try to answer this question immediately. Let's back up a little bit and we'll try to reason through the best way to answer this question. First, let's look at something that we might call the interval combination law. So suppose we have a function and suppose a is less than b is less than c. We might be interested in the definite integral on the interval from a to b, and the definite integral on the interval from b to c. And if we add these two integrals, it becomes pretty obvious, at least graphically, that the result of adding these two definite integrals should yield the definite integral from a to c. It seems reasonable to call this the interval combination law. If you have two successive intervals and you want to perform a definite integration on both of those and add them, then the result should be the definite integral on the larger interval. Now the only way this makes obvious sense is if a is less than b is less than c. Now by saying this is obvious, I should point out that we haven't proved it. You would need to go through a proof using limits of Riemann sums, and there'd be some technical difficulties, but conceptually this interval combination law seems intuitively clear and pretty easy to use. The interval combination law is so important and useful that it's going to cast a shadow on all the rest of this video. So now let's ask the question, what is the definite integral from A to A? Well, if we look at a picture and interpret the definite integrals yielding signed area, you might say, well, if you integrate from A to A, there's no area there, so this really should be zero. Isn't that obvious as well? Well, it depends on what you mean by obvious. You might think there's some cosmic justification for declaring that this is true, but since the definite integral really depended on building Riemann sums on an interval, there's really no technical justification for this. So let's try to think through more solid grounds on which we could make this definition. So here's what the strategy is going to be. We're going to preserve the interval combination law in new contexts. When you look abstractly at the interval combination law, what it says is that you can link up the limits of integration like so. And now we'll notice that if you happen to substitute limits of integration, where the first integral goes from A to A, then the template of the interval combination law would have you conclude that this is true. But those two obviously cancel, and you're left with this equation. So perhaps what we should do is define the definite integral from a to a to equal zero, and we're going to do this so that the interval combination law continues to hold in a more general setting. Let's call this definition the null integration law. And now, let's go back to the problem of right-to-left integration. Suppose we have the definite integral from b to a, and we add the definite integral from a to b. If your interval combination law is to hold in this case, then the net result should be the integral from b to b. But of course, the null integration law tells us that this right-hand side must equal zero. And so now where are we? 
we realize that the integral from b to a has to equal the opposite of the integral from a to b. So once again, we will make this a definition. We'll call it the limit swap law. And it just says that you can always switch the limits of integration at the cost of introducing a minus sign. And again, why do we make this definition? We make this definition so that the interval combination law continues to hold in a more general setting than just having your limits run from left to right. So we started with the interval combination law, which seems so intuitive when a is less than b is less than c. And from this, we concluded that if we want the interval combination law to continue to hold in more general settings, then we had better define the integral from a to a to be 0 and the integral from b to a to be the opposite of the integral from a to b. Let's work through an example. So here's a nice piecewise defined function where we have some segments and some quarter circles so that signed areas are going to be very easy to calculate. The first question is, what is the definite integral of the function from 0 to 11? Now you may have never thought explicitly about the interval combination law before this video, but I bet you've already used it if you've worked through any of these kinds of problems. Because what you would do naturally is break this integral up into little pieces, each of which is really easy to calculate. So here's an extended application of the interval combination law, and you'll notice that we've isolated individual areas that are very easy to calculate. So here, in fact, are two areas that wind up canceling their contributions are zero. What does that leave? It leaves these contributions, which are easily calculated to be 1, negative 1 1.5, and 6. The net result is that our definite integral we were looking for has the value 5.5. Now let's just put this off to the side. We're going to need this result later. Let's go to the next question. What's the integral of f from 11 to 2? Notice we're going backwards. Now, we're actually going to look at this three different ways. They're all related, of course, but we're going to put some emphasis on different ways of looking at this. So first off, you could imagine just integrating backwards. So option A we might call the direct option, which is how do you interpret backwards integration? So you could, when integrating backwards, interpret things exactly the opposite way you usually interpret them. In other words, areas above the horizontal axis should count negatively, and areas below the axis should count positively. So these are the usual contributions, but if we go backwards, they switch roles. So the integral from 11 to 2 would be given by negative 6 minus pi plus pi plus 2 or negative 4. Now, that's a lot of baggage for me to handle. I don't like to constantly think through how to do the opposite of what I'm supposed to do through a chain of calculations. So I would prefer to use option B, which is a direct application of the limit swap law. Right off the bat, we'll notice that the integral from 11 to 2 should be the opposite of the integral from 2 to 11. What's the advantage of this? Well, now that minus sign has been factored out, and what's left is the usual thing. So there's no new rules you have to work through working backwards. You just do what you usually do, and then in the end, you throw a minus sign in front. So the areas below count negatively, the areas above count positively, and of course, this calculation is going to yield the same result. Now here's option C, which might not be obvious at all when you first look at this, and maybe overkill in this case, but this is the kind of thing you should keep in mind when integrals become very complicated. This sort of sneaky method might be really useful. So we'll notice that the interval combination law tells us that the integral from 0 to 2 plus the integral from 2 to 11 should give us the integral from 0 to 11. Now in this example, this is useful because we already calculated the integral from 0 to 11. We already happen to know that that result was 5.5. Now the integral from 0 to 2 is quite easy to calculate. What does that mean? That means the integral from 2 to 11 must be 4. And now we apply the limit swap law to find that the integral from 11 to 2 should be negative 4. So let's look at this example. This looks horrible on the face of it. I and mean, we've got arguments e, root 17, pi squared. We're integrating all over the map. What is going on? 
Well, if you just take a breath and look at this, you realize it's really not hard because what's going on here is an application of the interval combination law tells us that the sum of these two integrals should just be the integral from e to root 17. And then another application of the interval combination law tells us that this integral should be the same as the integral from e to e. And that, by null integration, is zero. So it turns out this monstrous expression at the beginning was just equal to zero. Here are a few more thoughts about these interval combination laws. The interval laws are consistent both with each other and the laws of algebra. If you use them correctly, then you may use them fearlessly. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the integral from a to b. The limit swap law tells us this should be the opposite of the integral from b to a. Now one of the things you could do is apply the swap law again. What happens? Well, the integral from b to a is itself the opposite of the integral from a to b. And you'll notice that negative 1 times negative 1 is just 1. And so those two applications of the limit swap law canceled each other out, and you're back to where you belong. So what's the lesson here? Use the limit swap law as often as you wish, and you're not going to run into some sort of logical contradiction. Now let's take a look at the sum of the integral from a to b and b to a. The idea here is to examine how these laws are all consistent with each other. The interval combination law tells us that this sum should be the same as the integral from a to a. Null integration tells us that should be zero. But one question you might have is, wait a second, we're adding two things and addition is commutative. So we could switch the order of addition and now when we apply the interval combination law we get something that looks different on the face of it. But of course null integration tells us we get the same number. Of course there's a third way of looking at this. You could imagine taking the integral from a to b and expressing it as the opposite of the integral from b to a, in which case you have something minus the same something and that once again gives you zero. So again, what's the punchline here? You can use any of the interval combination laws in any kind of order you wish and you're not going to run into a problem. Just use them correctly. Let's end with this final thought. We arrived at the null integration law and the limit swap law in order to preserve the interval combination law in new contexts. So let's really look at the fact that the interval combination law now holds in more general contexts. Suppose you have arguments a less than c less than b. The usual interval combination law tells us that the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b should be the integral from a to b. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to subtract off the integral from c to b from both sides. That gives us this equation. Then we're going to use the interval swap law to exchange the limits of integration, c and b, on the right-hand side. We get this new equation. What does this equation state? The definite integral from a to b plus the definite integral from b to c winds up being the same as the definite integral from a to c. This is an expression of the interval combination law, but now the limits of integration don't run from left to right. And more generally, you can work out for yourself that the interval combination law works for all possible configurations of the limits a, b, and c. So please make sure you completely understand these three interval combination laws and that you're comfortable applying them in all sorts of contexts. They will make your life much easier if you're willing to perform these operations when you're trying to answer questions about definite integrals.